So, good morning. I think we should rejoice in being here because we are, not, we are the only people in the United States not trapped in a traffic jam. So we've done it right. Talking of doing it right, let me tell you what I mean by right. That's easy. It's the place of our gladness. It is the place where energy and intention converge. The example I will give you of doing it right comes from that very movie, Chariots of Fire, which is about uh, British runners training for the 1936 Berlin Olympics. One of the runners is a minister from Scotland, and his ultimate journey is to go as a missionary to China. His sister is harassing him because he's wasting his time training for the Olympics. And finally, he turns to her and he says, when I run, I feel God's pleasure in me. I think that's good. All right, let's talk about doing it wrong. What I mean by doing it wrong is an inside job. I am not telling you not to steal the Judson silver. I'm a kind person, and I want to save you a lot of trouble and inevitable disappointment. Between our roof and our elevators, I guarantee you there is not a silver candlestick left standing. So, the inside job. I know you all, and I know that you're sitting politely, but you're basically wondering, what on earth does she mean? What is she nattering on about doing it wrong? Well, I'm gonna make it easy for you because I'm gonna give you an example from my own plentiful experience. A few weeks ago, I came back from four days in West Stockbridge that I had spent with my darling partner. I came back to New York and inexplicably, I just, had the urgent need to reestablish myself in New York. I just needed to unpack my suitcase. I turned it upside down. I just needed to sort out the laundry. Laundry, ironing, I need to make an efficiency list. I mean, it went on and on. And then I thought, I need to call my friend Sue. She has just spent four days in Ohio with her mother who is demented and her sister who is depressed. Hmm. What would a friend of 30 years do but call up and say, Sue, how did it go? She said, oh God, it was awful. My mother does circuit training. She begins with, do I still look pretty? And then she moves on to, nobody comes to visit me. That's especially for the people who come to visit her. And then of course, she ends up with, I don't think I like this hotel. I think you should move me to a better place. And on top of all that, Sue went on, of course she forgot my birthday. She forgot your birthday? That is... And so did your friend of 30 years. Went right past it. That's embarrassing. That's doing it wrong. But after apologizing and hanging up, I felt called upon to make it worse. <laughs> How do you do that? Judgment and labeling. The one-two knockout punch. Punch number one, the rhetorical question. How could I have done that? What is the matter with me? Punch number two, the answer to the question. The matter with me is, I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. I'm a dope. I'm a dodo. Blah, da, da, blah, da, da, blah. So let me tell you what I think of judgment. Judgment stops us from thinking. Judgment stops us from discussion. Judges stops us from exploration. Self-judgment is the worst form of self violence, according to me. When we are in judgment land, we cannot learn what it is we need to know. And I am here to say that every time we do it wrong, we are trying to get our own attention to something that we need to learn. So how would we do that? Well, we're ditching judgment, bad, dull judgment. 
And then we're constructing a beautiful bridge from doing it wrong to a love story. And we call the bridge curiosity. We call it interest. We call it investigation. Be interested, don't judge. I say it a hundred times a day to the people I work with. Now, rumor has it that we only teach what we have to learn. I'm not sure I've learned it, but I'll let you know. So here we are. We are constructing our bridge called curiosity. And the pre-work, the foundation of this work, is that we remember and we repair the superhighway to our own inherent goodness. We cannot do anything until we connect with our intrinsic nature, which is good. Once we have done that, we can begin to think a little. Then we think, hmm, how would I like to talk to myself? In an inviting voice, in a let's go into the kitchen, have a cup of tea, and sort this out together. So then we begin to ask questions. What happened? Why now? What if? We ask why questions. Why do you think this happened? Why do you think this unfolded this way? What was your intention? What was your goal? What happened? We wonder about the state of our relationships. Do we feel tucked into a warm, appreciative circle of friends? Or are we maybe a little isolated, a little anxious? If you had known, really known, how good you were and are, if you had known, really known, how kind you were and are, if you had known, really known, how smart you were and are, what might you have done differently? What action might you take now? In the end, all of our actions must become opportunities for us to know ourselves better. What I needed to learn from my miserable phone call with my friend Sue was simple. I needed to learn that when I feel an urgency, when I can't figure out whether I want to make a to-do list, listen to my phone messages, check the icebox for the food, decide whether I should go and buy flowers right now, listen to the sound of my pillbox opening and all the pills, drifting across the floor, which of course I cannot see. Maybe I should stop. Maybe I should get quiet. Maybe I should get present. Because what I had done was take out feeling avoidance strategy 107, known as the whirlwind, right? When I am whirling around trying to figure out what I want to do first, trying to figure out what I should be doing, trying to figure out, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And then I try and call my friend Sue. It's going to happen. What I needed to learn was I was not the friend I want to be to Sue, but feeling avoidance strategy 107 was not a friend to me. And I need to remember that. I need to know the impulse to scatter and fragment is not my friend. So here we are. We've gone across the bridge called curiosity. We've arrived at the love story. What I mean by that in secular terms is that I define intelligence as the highest form of love. And I believe we manifest that through the intention, through the attention we give ourselves and each other. Put simply, if we are not smart enough to know that we are good, whatever else we know doesn't matter. 
in a larger perspective here at Judson. Some of us know that Andy Franz, who is our grand poobah of the Sunday School, did the sermon a few weeks ago. And he reminded us that God's promise to us is to be with us always. That means if we are dead drunk and flying off the bridge, or if we are listening to the most transcendent music ever written, which we here in Judson, in fact, heard when Sarah and Letha sang the duet from Lakme. I mean, just, was it not extraordinary? The answer is yes. Um, that God is with us, whatever we are doing. And God is a God of love. And I am given to understand that that love is supposed to be a model for how we treat ourselves and treat each other. Now, if we have ever attended or participated in a Christian marriage ceremony, we know that we have been called. We have been named beloved. More than that, dearly beloved. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here to celebrate. And it's not just to celebrate the two people getting married. It is to celebrate the truth of our belovedness. It is to celebrate the truth of God's pleasure in us. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>